in Houston. I'm John Herter. Tuesday, 7th day of February. Great as always to have you along, everybody. In a nutshell, From the Experts is a virtual networking opportunity flow accelerator, helping leaders across industries connect very quickly in a brief moderated show format. It's like a TED Talk with interaction. So what's in it for you? Well, I promise if all goes well, your curiosity spark, new ideas accelerate into action, and you may have helped yourself or somebody else solve a problem, make a connection, reach that opportunity faster. Folks, help me welcome guest expert Steve Hughes. He's president and CEO of HCS International. Steve has more than 40 years of supply chain experience in the automotive aftermarket industry and ocean shipping working or consulting for some of the leading companies in these industries. He currently represents and advises both the Auto Care and MEMA trade associations, as well as the Federal Maritime Commission's National Shipper Advisory Committee. Well-known industry advisor on the subject of supply chain and ocean shipping, Steve is a frequent panelist and speaker at key industry conferences, including the Trans-Pacific Maritime Conference, or TPM 23, and the FTE show had to put that in there. Hey, Steve, really grateful that you could, you know, stop in and connect with our network, share your latest insights uh, and why it actually matters to people's business today. I'll leave it to you. <laughs> thanks, John. And thanks for inviting me to share my thoughts today on the FTE show. Um, and thanks, thanks everybody for joining us. I'll be running through a few slides to share what we're seeing in ocean shipping and sh supply chain today and, and looking forward. One quick note uh, for those of you that aren't in the shipping industry, I'll be using the term BCO, which means beneficial cargo owner. In ocean shipping parlance, whether you're an importer or an exporter, you're, you are referred to as a BCO. So at this point, most people have accepted the fact that the pandemic has turned into an endemic. Even so, the effects of COVID continue to have an impact, albeit waning, on the goods movement system around the world. With that said, even though we're closing in on the end of the biggest supply chain disruption in history, let's step beyond the COVID-related disruption for a moment and talk about disruption history in general. The effects of COVID on the international shipping industry and supply chains around the world have caused disruption beyond even the shipping industry's worst nightmares. Unfortunately, disruption in ocean shipping has been a common theme for many years now. For those of you that may have forgotten or don't know, let's look back at some recent history. In 2014-15, we had the ILWU contract negotiations that sent everybody's supply chain into a tailspin at virtually every port in the nation. And some of you might remember the Hanjin bankruptcy in 2016 that stranded ships and cargo around the globe. 2017 and 18 brought massive issues with space and freight rates due to the chaos caused by the implementation of the Trump tariffs. Now, 2019 was relatively quiet, but then 2020 came along and gave us the biggest disruptor of all, COVID. And here we are three years later, and although we're seeing a light at the end, we still aren't out of the woods. As a side note, during the middle of 2021, we had the grounding of the Ever Given in the Suez Canal, which only added to the nightmare, and now we have a war in Ukraine. These are both great examples of how a solitary event, big or small, can upend supply chains. So when you look at it, there's been significant disruption to shipping and supply chains seven out of the last eight years. So if you really think COVID will be the last ocean shipping disruption, you're, you're going to see affect your supply chain. Uh, you're probably not aware of the two or three issues that are presenting themselves right now. Um, this is a slide from a website called marinetraffic.com. The green arrows are container ships at sail, if you will. The green dots are ships at anchor, if, if you can see them. I've filtered out tankers and fishing and cruise lines to give you a clear view of the immense volumes crossing our oceans. In fact, when you zoom in, you will see a much higher concentration of ships. Now, every logistics department should have this as a favorite on their browser to get overall visibility on ports around the world and locally in real time. And for a nominal fee, it can also be used to track individual ships. So, Container shipping, well, what's your, what's your strategy? Direct with a carrier and VOCC, shippers association or a hybrid. Uh, it's imperative to have a realistic understanding of where your company's shipping volumes place you and the power struggle for space during disruption. So that presents a big question that requires you to put an ego aside and self-evaluate your company. Does your ocean shipping volume support going direct with an ocean carrier? 
The next two points speak volumes to where your company sits in the eyes of a, of a carrier. Depending upon who you talk to, there are between 150 and 200,000 BCOs who ship through our nation's ports annually. Of that, only 3,200 BCOs import 1,000 or more containers a year. Now, typically carriers won't contract with BCOs that move less than 1,000 containers a year. They'd rather focus on the larger accounts. So even if you're able to convince a carrier to agree to a direct relationship, when it comes to a container needing to be loaded during tough times or peak seasons, what are the odds that they're going to service you better or the same as their larger accounts? And to give you a better understanding of where your volume fits in the greater scheme, let's consider the top 100 shippers. The number one importer in volume in North America is Walmart at 930,000 containers a year. 930,000. In second place, a distant second place, is Target at 650,000 a year. Dropping to number 100 on the list is American Honda at 14,700 a year. In general, these companies were booking at contract rates of 3,000, approximately $3,000 per container from Asia to the West Coast and having their cargo loaded on the first call, even during the worst times of 2021. During that same period of time, most other companies were paying anywhere between $20,000 and $35,000 per container and still having their cargo rolled sometimes. So understanding your volume and strategic place in the market, you have to ask yourself, what are the choices out there or balance that may allow you to safeguard margins and have a better chance of getting your cargo loaded in both good and disruptive times? Freight terms. What freight terms best suit your business model? Which terms are most cost effective? Depending upon your business model and vendor base, <clears throat> excuse me, this can be somewhat of a rabbit hole, but it's well worth your time to review and understand your options. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, John, uh, slide please. There we go. So let's take a look at your supply chain. Starting with your value proposition, cons proposition, consider the money, people, and effort you put into your sales department selling your products. The next link in your, in, in your chain is the purchasing department. Again, consider the monies, people, and efforts you put into that department. Most companies spend a lot of time, money, and effort finding and qualifying suppliers to make their products. The next link in the chain is international logistics, which manages the transportation of products to the warehouse store. Of course, you spend a huge portion of your budget and support in warehousing your products. And lastly, consider the time, money, and effort in finding and managing your domestic logistic partners. Now let's go back to the international logistics department. It goes without saying that every link in this chain is critical. Does your budget and support of the logistics department correlate with the important part it plays in your overall business? In the course of advising companies, it, it, it's not been uncommon for me to find a lack of understanding and support, both politically and financially, for this critical department. The, the logistics department is every bit as important as every other link in your supply chain. So why do so many companies ignore, or yeah, ignore its incredible importance? I've also seen communication and collaboration between logistics and other departments lacking in many cases. Is there a steady flow of up-to-date information flowing between all the relevant departments, including the C-suite? Does that information allow you to make appropriate and timely proactive and strategic decisions? Do the other departments keep the logistics department advised in kind? Lastly, I found an interesting array of people that were in charge of logistics who had no realistic knowledge of the intricacies of running it. Believe it or not, I've seen sales clerks, warehouse personnel, and underqualified, distracted, and overworked purchasing people doing this work. Considering all of the above, given that this department is responsible for free, arranging the transportation and clearance of your merchandise into this country, do you think your current budget and support of the department is appropriate? Do you think that the right management and support staff is in place? One of the most important aspects of shipping management is knowing what's going on in the industry. Disruption in ocean shipping makes for a very fluid and volatile problem facing your supply chain. Staying ahead of what's going on in ocean shipping is critical to forecasting and managing risk in the supply chain. 
just by reading these headlines, you get an understanding of the challenges ahead. So spread between East West Coast uh, spot rates returns to pre-pandemic level, that's good news. Ocean shippers may pay up for secure capacity despite weak market, not so good. Uh, fallout from ocean rate collapse to define market status quo in 23. Uh, you better find out what that's about. And some, uh, some recent news, Maersk and MSC, the two largest container shipping ship, shippers are um, splitting from their alliance. And then here's a very important one, ILWU sending message to West Coast terminals as contract talks drag on. As you can see, these news stories quite often give an understanding of what has or will hit your supply chain and better enables your team to deal with and mitigate risk, not to mention keeping management advised of future trends. Make sure your, te your team is reading the shipping news every day. A subscription to the Journal of Commerce is a must. It's one of the best sources of information on shipping. Uh, freight waves, American Shipper, or Maritime Exec Executive are a few other great options to start. Um, education, making sure your team is educated and up to date is critical. TPM is the preeminent ocean shipping conference in the world, the who's who of shipping conferences, and is not to be missed if your team is to understand future trends in shipping. So is your, if, is, is your team attending? And if so, make sure they are, uh, they check out the TPM Academy. It's a great new educational series there. Um, IANA is an intermodal conference. It's also good value for your team. So staying informed on shipping news and attending shipping webinars and conferences is a critical aspect of supply chain and risk management. So do you have a budget for supporting and educating your logistics department? Supply chain and strategy slide. This slide alone could easily generate discussions running the entire day. Um, and even though it's a bit off topic from shipping, this is a very relevant to your overall supply chain resilience. So without taking a deep dive, it's important for every company, um, each and every company, review its supply chain strategies to build the necessary re resilience. And as you can see, each one of these choices needs serious research before you even begin to consider such a change. Final thoughts. We are now at a point where freight rates are at or below pre-COVID levels. At the same time, companies nationwide are overstocked with goods that were imported at extremely high freight costs. Over the course of the next six to 12 months, as we see inventories drop and costs of goods come down due to lower freight costs, some industries will see competitive pressures push consumer pricing downwards. Many companies through sheer volume or from strategic planning, we're able to successfully manage or navigate through the disruption and maintain some of their margins. How did your company fare? Ocean carriers have taken their massive profits from the last three years and invested them in new ship orders. Over the course of the next three years, there will be a massive influx of capacity that will not be offset by scrapping. How aggressively are the carriers going to manage their fleets to manage rates and how will it affect you? So I have three, three takeaways. One, as I pointed out at the beginning of this program, it's not if, but when we will see disruption again. Two, the only way to future-proof your business is to be proactive and not reactive. And three, and the way to be proactive is to educate, plan, and execute. In the end, disruption doesn't usually give you a lot of notice and can be a very fluid situation to address. The only way to future-proof your supply chain is by making sure you have the team is your team is educated, is up to date on shipping issues, and communicating those issues to the appropriate management the minute they gain visibility, all the way up to the C-suite. Once that's in place, putting together a solid program with the appropriate service providers will put your company in a much better position when the next disruption hits. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. Uh, we have one question. Uh, it says, well, if all our alternative fuels, or how, if at all, are alternative fuels impacting the shipping industry, electrification, hydrogen, biofuels, et cetera? Uh, there's a lot going on in that right now. My, my knowledge base is not real deep on that, uh, but I have seen, um, uh, I have seen a, a big push for ammonia. And ammonia can be broken into hydrogen very easily. Yeah. So um, ammonia is a big push in in uh, shipping right now. 
I did see, I think, inter islands in the in Japan, they're using some electric ships, so battery powered. Um, so there is a push for this. And it's a great question because ocean shipping represents 7% of the pollution of the world, which was shocking. And if you consider how much ocean shipping has grown since, let's say, the 60s, um, it's, it's exponentially grown. Um, so... I don't think it's going to get any smaller. Uh, so that that is a genuine issue that uh, the shipping industry is very much involved in trying to resolve. Well, thanks for that. So we're rolling over into the discussion, the interactive discussion part. So if you guys can turn on your screens, boy, that always helps. Uh, if you have a question directly for anything that Steve said, or you have, uh, you can see the uh, group questions that we added in there about the key trends, drivers influencing supply chain or what have you been doing uh, uh, to dis uh, in your disrupted business differently now after COVID? So you can raise your hand and just uh, say a little bit about what you're doing in your 60 second share. So with that, uh, anybody wanna step up and ask their question of Steve? I've got uh, Jacqueline here, actually, uh, she saved me here. Uh, Jacqueline, why don't you just uh, announce it out loud? I'm so glad you could join us today. Sure. Um, so my name is Jackie. I work in um, e-commerce pricing at UPS. Um, and one of the questions I had is, um, obviously, there are outside disruptions um, within supply chain. But if there's um, maybe a technology disruption or even a consumer disruption, um, how does that impact kind of the resiliency of the supply chain? And how do you see those technical innovations needing to be, become top of mind and how do we kind of plan for that kind of thing? Okay, I'm trying to wrap my mind around your question here. So, um, go ahead. so I can just, I can give an example. So um, one of the things that we're hearing, well, more broadly in the market, not really from EPS, but is, um, for example, like if um, makeup or food has different ingredients, there's ingredient tracking, and so they can kind of trace all of those back to their origins, making sure they're sustainably grown or sustainably sourced, fair trade, and all that kind of stuff. So um, that level of detail, you know, do you anticipate that kind of disrupting how supply chain um, resiliency can be formed? Well, you, there is a serious problem right now with uh, um, the tracing of, the, uh, of forced labor, the Uyghur Act. Um, uh, for, for those of you that are unaware, uh, the Chinese have a, uh, have, are using forced labor in the Xinjiang, I believe it is Xinjiang region of China, um, to name just one of the areas that this is happening. And the U.S. government put in a uh, law about, I think it was a year and a half ago, it was signed into uh, law, and it's the Uyghur Act. And basically, supply chain has to uh, the the buyers here, the importers, have to have a trace all the way back to the input stage of products for uh, of final goods, let's say. Um, if part of your product, even raw materials I read recently, are sourced from the Uyghur region, uh, CBP can basically seize your shipment. And uh, you're going to have to prove that there was no forced labor used in producing this product. It's, it's a real mess, and uh, this is another subject that could be an all-day discussion. Um, does that answer your question, Jacqueline, or is that a good example for you? Yeah, yeah. so that's one example. Um, I'm wondering, too, um, on a technology standpoint, um, there's been some idea of kind of a trackable QR code, too, on like ingredients so that you can trace that all the way back to sources and anything. I was wondering if you were aware of any other technologies um, that might be similar in that it kind of changing the visibility of, of supply chains for companies. There is so much going on in, in uh, the data side of, of supply chain, it's crazy. Um, on, on the traceability of components from any given industry, it's going to be different from from in, from industry to industry, from company to company, uh, until there's a standard. So I can't talk in in real depth to all the variations of it. Um, all I can talk about is what's what's going on in the shipping industry, not as in the uh, supply chain uh, on a granular level, if you will. That's at this fair. Point. 
Thank you. So we've got a question from uh, Bill. He says, last year we had a container shipping cost increase from 3,000 to 40,000 for container yeah. values from Asia. Is this going to happen again, do you think? I, I don't think so. As bad as 40,000 was, it's not the worst I've seen. I've seen them upwards, upwards of 58,000. Um, so it, <laughs> it's, it's pretty insane. But uh, I don't think we'll have this again uh, unless we have some sort of a, of a massive pandemic again, which uh, I think we're past that at least for another 20, 30 years, hopefully. Um, it, 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 you have to consider how it happened. Every company has flexibility in their in their system or their operating system or what have you to absorb growth to a certain amount. When pan, when the pandemic hit, when COVID hit, and all of a sudden the economy got flooded with cash and consumers were sitting at home and started buying stuff, it wasn't a five percent increase in in sales. It was twenty percent increase in consumer purchasing which completely overwhelmed the ocean shipping industry because who in any business model would have a growth factor of 20% built into their business model? It just isn't there. And ocean shipping takes tremendous amount of capital investment to support growth. Now, with that said, the shipping industry, which they tend to do, has, in my view, overreacted a bit. Um, New equipment that's scheduled on the order books from the various ocean carriers. On the books right now, they have something like 300 container ships coming into service this year alone. Now, last year, they didn't even scrap. I think they scrapped less than 50 container ships. Next year, they've got somewhere, they're scheduled to bring in a, upwards of 200 ships. And then the year beyond, uh, 24, I think it's uh, uh, over 100. When you consider all this volume coming into the system and the scrapping is not going to come anywhere close to offsetting that and the new IMO International Maritime Organization slow shipping and emissions rules is not going to slow down the capacity the movement of capacity enough to offset this this increase in, in the capacity either so I think what you're going to see is an overcapacity for quite some time you know that Sorry to interrupt you, but you know, in terms of capacity, Sandra was talking about, hey, has, has there been more growth uh, uh, in terms of manufacturing and supply in the United States to try to replenish some of the product deficits? I mean, what are you seeing there? And this goes to your focus on uh, strategy, folks. Yes, I mean, um, changing your supply chain is not something that happens overnight. Um, it, it can take upwards of two years before going through and vetting out new manufacturing or moving to um, uh, moving manufacturing back to the United States or setting starting with a greenfield site and building it up. This could take two, three, four years until you've got it completely put in place and and uh, back up to speed and supply. So. Onshoring is is a tough proposition for for large industry, smaller industry. It's maybe not as bad. Um, I've done it myself. I've I've onshored uh, manufacturing at my old company, but it was fairly eat straightforward. Um, I I have seen some nearshoring. So we have some some uh, companies that have brought uh, manufacturing into Mexico, or are leveraging factories that were already existent in Mexico that they weren't leveraging before. Same thing in Canada. So we're seeing some of that strategy. Um, one of the things that I am seeing people uh, rely on more and more or, or do more and more, and that is uh, searching for an alternate source, uh, moving away from China. Um, we're seeing quite a shift to India. Uh, there's been a shift to Vietnam for a while. Um, I think we'll start to see more and more of that in both countries as we see infrastructure uh, beefed up in both. So we have folks from different, uh, whether it's chemical manufacturing or automotive. Uh, Julie, what have you been seeing or, you know, from your experience, uh, what have you been seeing here? Or perhaps Michelle, one of you two could share from the, the automotive perspective. I got a text from Michelle. She's in the car, so it may be a little tough. <laughs> Give her a minute. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so I've been out of the, the industry for a little bit, taking a little break um, and, and join this to just try to stay in the loop on everything. But um, I think in the automotive industry, I think a lot of what you know Steve was saying were looking for other origins um, to get product, you know, Vietnam, Mexico, all of those things. Um, as well as, um, you know, I think it all depends too on like the location of your distribution centers. And that plays a huge factor into, you know, how you're bringing stuff in. Um, for me being on the, you know, in the New England area and, you know, depending on the number of distribution centers you have, you know, Boston, the port of Boston is a great port. It's a small port, and um, but they do a great job. And so trying to kind of mix it up into where you can bring your stuff in and get it in in a timely manner is a little bit of struggle for companies on the East Coast um, near the smaller ports. Yeah, and that, that actually brings in another point. Thanks, Julie. Um, you know, when you shift your, your supply chain from one country to another, like uh, I, I did a small analysis for somebody that wanted to shift from China to India. Um, there's a cost to that. It's not a cost in freight so much as you have another week and a half, two weeks of extended sailing time. So what does that do? Well, that ends up having to, you're going to have to bring in more inventory, put it on the shelf to, to uh, support that added lead time. Um, it, uh, that's another very important factor when they're making decisions. I, uh, I had a company actually ask me, well, I want to move from Los Angeles because of the very tough business environment out here and move to Texas. My, my, my uh, warehouse costs are going to go down dramatically. My tax base is going to go down dramatically, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, so what's the freight cost going to be? I said, well, the freight cost is going to be this much. Well, that offsets this. I said, but you've got to add another two and a half weeks, two, two and a half weeks to the transit time to get the product to you. I said, so you're gonna to have to add that much inventory. When everything started to add up, he stayed here in California, much to his chagrin. Right. So any any lessons learned out there? I know Caesar, you're there. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what you're facing out at the port and what's on your mind? Absolutely. Um, uh, thank you for, uh, for the invite. Um, you know, Port of Long Beach, and, and just to, um, yeah. you know, reflect back a little bit about question about uh, different ports and, and options, uh, you know, one of the, I believe one of the things that was most prominent during the uh, the pandemic was the development of other ports, uh, smaller ports and the infrastructure built out, which is, I think, a good thing for uh, customers in general. Um, I think as we now move into the next phase, um, where the port of LA, port of Long Beach, um, you know, where basically volumes have have diminished. Um, again, a cyclical thing. It's something we see every year, but more so this year because of, of the ongoing labor negotiations. Uh, we did see a shift in volume go over to the East Coast and Gulf, but slowly we're seeing that volume or some of that volume coming back to the West Coast. Folks are feeling a bit more comfortable that. Um, there has been minimal disruptions and or actions from, from the labor. Um, obviously, ports are very fluid. Uh, vessels are coming alongside, getting worked. Chassis are no longer an issue. Truckers are ample. Warehouses are starting to open up again. So a lot of great indicators. But more importantly, when you're looking at your gateway of choice, you need to look at your network, right? Where is Where are your receiving warehouses? Where are your distribution centers? Um, one of the, I, I would say, major benefits of utilizing the West Coast, be it Port of Long Beach, Port of LA, um, still uh, to this date uh, for Trans-Pacific is transit mm -hmm. and the costing of ocean freight. Yep. And yes, you can look at that in, in various ways, but the reality is you have to also look at your inventory cost and your carrying cost of inventory, right? So that, that should determine what your, your port of choice should be. Um, and again, where is your, your buying power? Where are your consumers? So we're, we're here, we're as fluid as we've ever been. 
Uh, there was a lot of uh, lessons learned during the pandemic. I, I know we all struggled, uh, but there was a lot of lessons learned. I can tell you the Port of Long Beach uh, continues in, in their approach to, to grow the infrastructure by building out the rail side of the business. Um, we've allotted $2.6 billion uh, in money for infrastructure. About $1.5 billion of that money is going to the rail B plan, which yeah. will allow us to move a total of about 35 to 40% of total volume coming through the ports through the rail. So we, we believe that would be the next phase to allow us to you know, uh, increase the volumes more so than we did in, in 2021 and 2022, be it, you know, 10 million for the Port of Long Beach um, and, and give or take and another 10 million for the Port of LA uh, hitting a, a milestone of 20 million TUs, yeah. which by far is, is the most we've seen uh, through any North America gateway. Any uh, yeah. feedback from you on that, Steve, before we go to another question? No, you know, uh, LA Long Beach uh, ports are great ports. Um, it's uh, unfortunately with the volume that comes through the West Coast, it, it became a choke point. Um, you know, again, because of a 20% increase in overall imports, um, it's, uh, nobody was able to handle that. Nobody was prepared for that. So what happened from the COVID uh, crunch of, of volume coming over was what I considered uh, kind of a whack-a-mole with uh, BCOs. They were looking for the for the easiest point point of entry. So we we did see a lot of the the cargo shift to the Gulf and East Coast ports to avoid the backlog, which this year this time last year was 109 ships. Now we've got zero uh, out out in the bay uh, or in, in queue, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, that all shifted to the to the East Coast for two reasons: one, to avoid the, the the backlog here, and also because of the fear of the ILWU and what might be happening or what could be happening. Uh, but uh, to Caesar's uh, point, yeah, it's it's shifting back because there's uh, the cargo is flowing fluently now. There's no issues. I drove drove by there recently, and I was surprised at how how uh, clear the terminals, uh, the decks that the terminals are looking these days. So, um, yeah. So, so any other feedback, uh, Lori? I know you're coming from uh, recently moving from Shell over to the the chemical manufacturing business. What are you hearing from uh, uh, the HCS team with regards to to this? Yeah, actually, um, I joined this one more to learn, and um, a lot of what the HCS group, at least for Halterman Carlos, that I'm involved with, um, do are, are are really organized through Germany, and of course, the Troy, Michigan office has a, um, a strong office there. Down in Texas right now, we're a petrochemical company and very heavily dependent on yeah. rail cars and tank trucks, um, which clearly, or at least uh, generally speaking, most of that um, uh, material transfers from the Gulf Coast up East Coast, um, potentially a south uh, into Mexico. Mm -hmm. So this was really for me to learn. I'm so glad you really I really appreciate Steve's input and everybody's yeah. input here. Thank you. So uh, Steve Sharp, you have your hand up. Oh, you got to unmute yourself. There you go. I do. I have a, I mean, Steve, you said it earlier. I mean, the supply chain is like a giant global jigsaw puzzle that can be impacted from a million different directions. I have a little bit different technology question, and that is the, the sea freight business has been kind of floating out there, the adoption of the blockchain for quite some time. I think Maersk, if, as memory serves, if I got that right, was kind of eluding to getting to that, which of course opens the door for cryptocurrency and all that other stuff, which might sound like a small deal, but there's a lot of infrastructural technology required to, to deal with that. Any idea where the landscape is on that these days? You know, it, it's, it's funny that you bring that up because it's gone suspiciously quiet. Uh, I saw a lot of that uh, back two years ago, prior, prior to COVID, I saw a lot of talk about it. Um, I haven't seen too much, uh, uh, discussion about it. I know there's a lot of various companies, um, uh, um, tech companies that are getting involved in shipping, but I don't hear it from the carriers. 
Um, so I can't speak to it too much. And, I, and I'm quite honestly, I'm not an authority on that. So I, I don't want to uh, dig, dig myself a hole, if you will. That's fair enough. Fair enough. Um, so Rebecca, thank you for joining us. I know you're responsible uh, for a certain part of a energy policy. I think that is uh, maybe not the best way to say it, uh, but I'm glad you're here. Do you, what are you watching? What's your take? Uh, uh, from your position, Rebecca Dow. Um, can you hear me okay? Gotcha. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Um, so my main role is just uh, monitoring a lot of the policy side on supply chain mm -hmm. and how this has evolved, not just post pandemic, but also in a uh, constant state of flux um, geopolitically thanks to the war in Ukraine. And so that has direct implications for the states in which I engage um, a lot of interaction. So I, I approach it from a policy perspective, but obviously there's a lot of change happening in that space in addition to the practical field implementation itself. So that's kind of my interest areas in what I look at. Cool, got it. Um, Kevin, I know you're putting together a, uh, uh, a plant uh, concept here. Uh, from your perspective, are you, are you concerned uh, or what questions do you have related to this topic? Uh, well, I would say uh, my primary concern is, is on kind of one-off um, one procurement of major components. That would be my main concern. And I was wondering if there's any insights, like anything particular to that, uh, you know, large, you know, multi-million dollar uh, turbines or uh, something like that, that, that are difficult to move. Um, and has there been any kind of specific uh, slowdown in that respect in terms of, um, you know, the logistics of moving them for one thing because it requires, uh, you know, specialized equipment or, you know, have you heard of these kind of major components, uh, just the supply of them, um, the supply side being slowed down? I think the entire supply chain has been slowed down dramatically from COVID. Um, it, now it is recovering because you're seeing the the ports um, uh, loosen up quite a bit these days. But uh, brake bulk um, tankers they've all slowed down because of the backlog. I mean, they were it was easier for them, especially the tankers, because they can get to uh, you know they have a separate terminal where they where they offload or or load. But um, it's still there's quite quite a queue, um, and, and you know what that's that's something that maybe even Caesar can speak to a bit more. But uh, I think there has been a slowdown, uh, but uh, things are are moving better. And then I I have seen on break bulk or or these larger ships that are, are are bringing in something like you're describing. I've seen some huge equipment on some of these carriers. Now I I don't track the volume. That's you know because it's very very specialized. Um, but uh, it's it's a very interesting aspect of the ocean shipping industry for sure. Uh, Caesar, did you want to uh, comment on that? If not, I was going to see if Sergey. I know you work in this space. Is there something that you'd like to share in your uh, consulting of the value chain? I can see he's typing down here. He says, uh, no, this is uh, from Sandra, but Ser uh, Sergey, go ahead if you want to. Uh, same with you, Caesar. There's a question. Is there a central website updated information on supply chain showing important ports, main products that have been transported in their origins, timeframes, delays? So it looks like she's looking for some basic uh, uh, flow information. Do you have that, Steve or, or Caesar? Maybe you have something that you guys could share. Most nothing. Yes, uh, Caesar here. Not, not, nothing at the moment. Um, I know, you know, Port of Long Beach is uh, building out the supply chain information highway. Yep. Um, and this is a basically a collaborative effort between not only Port of Long Beach, but other um, port authorities, be it on the West Coast, East Coast and Gulf, uh, to help provide some visibility. Um, now we're in the phase two of the testing uh, of this program. Um, and really it's it's providing customers, uh, be it BCO importers, the ability to 
see their, their flow of freight uh, through API, uh, EDI uh, transmissions uh, along the way from origin uh, all the way to final destination. Um, and it's us collecting that data through the various vendors along the way. Uh, again, we're in phase two now, uh, and in this phase, we're adding BCOs as a test pilot program, uh, but we're hopeful that this will help provide some additional visibility. The data actually will be shared with um, uh, BCOs directly, and it'll be free of charge. So mm -hmm. we're just basically compiling the information um, and, and pulling it uh, to provide it directly to, to our customers. So that's 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 in the horizon, but that's something that we're still working on, and and nothing current that I'm aware of today. Thanks, Caesar. Uh, Steve, any last words before we? Well, I'll just I'll just pick up on what Caesar said, and that is, uh, you know, a lot of the the cargo coming in it's proprietary. Um, uh, to find out who it's coming from, uh, what origin port. Um, uh, the type of product, uh, even the vendors, that's, um, it's actually in the public domain. Uh, you can uh, sign on to some of these data diving services uh, uh, like uh, peers uh, to, to find that information. But uh, if a company has gone to CPP and, and, and uh, filed for manifest confidentiality, that, that information is not there. Well, thank you, Steve. That, that's got to be the last word for today. Our promise was to keep this in 45 minutes, but guess what? We can continue the conversation. So I've put up the FTE survey poll. Would you kindly fill that 30-second survey out? It helps us get better. Reminder that today's post-show notes will actually be out a little bit later today. It'll hit your mailbox and take the time to connect with each other. That's why we're here. Next up from the experts. March 7th, the Energy Transition Channel in partnership with the Endeavor Institute. His focus is on clean power, geothermal energy, that is, clean, stable, cost-effective, and that can be delivered in small footprint built anywhere. Kevin Mullen, CEO of GreenQuest Power, leads that discussion. Other episodes coming up, S&P Global Commodity Insights, Hydrogen Pricing Analyst Santiago Canal Soria explores pricing model concepts for the low carbon hydrogen and derivatives markets. That's gonna be a hot one. Accenture Stability Sustainability Business Architect Team Lead, Sarah Burns. She's coming on to share insights on how companies can most effectively communicate their roadmap to net zero. The communication part, not easy. So with over 800 members, 20,000 followers across 25 industries, the FTE network is growing very quickly accelerating network opportunity flow for you and your business. Wondering where you fit in? Just learn more about our individual memberships in the FTE Plus for Business on our website at fte.network. Folks, we're out of time. Hey, Steve, thanks once again. I'm really grateful, and for everyone here, for making time to connect and learn on the FTE show. So we'll see you guys next time. All the best. Thanks for coming. Thanks, John.